What's up? I like your background, man. Thank you. <laughs> it looks familiar. Good to have you uh, on behalf of the Museum of Graffiti. Thank you for joining us for the Artist Happy Lives Happy to talk. be here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, Peter, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to flip the screen and uh, take a minute to read your your uh, your bio um, and uh, you know some of your history very briefly um, to the folks that are joining us. Um, uh, uh, Peter Levine, a.k.a. Peter Paid, hails from Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, where he lived uh, conveniently adjacent to a subway train layup that was a well-known destination for train riders. Uh, he began his artistic education at the famed High School of Art and Design, where he would meet other kids who shared his passion for graffiti. And it was at this school where he honed in his style writing talents. Uh, and he was among many luminaries that has passed through its doors. Notably, he would be influenced by the New Wave crew led by Ernie Pays, Size, and Marcus Entz, who was also from his neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, as a youth, he got into playing music and, and DJing early, early on and would go on to spin at some of New York's hottest clubs of the time, like Limelight, Red Zone, and others. He would parlay his... Uh, graffiti skills into a diversified career that included album cover designs, logo designs, and working, working as a letterer for the New York City Department of Transportation, where he designed and fabricated highway signs and street signs for the five boroughs. Uh, also add to his credit that uh, he has painted, hand painted the world renowned murals for the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, and also has done the New York Nick's Go New York playoff uh, uh, mural of uh, that time. Uh, in 2018, he transitioned his own unique style into a focused studio practice with the intent of blurring the lines between commercial sign painting and fine art. And in 2020, Peter Paid was selected uh, as an artist commissioned to take part in the Black Lives Matter mural point painted in front of New York's Supreme Court building at Foley Square amongst many things. So we'll, we'll dive into all of this and then some. But boy, I, 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 I should travel with you with that opening. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Peter, you, you know, one of the things that I enjoy about um, these talks and, and, and about sharing these stories and these unlikely journeys of kids who uh, put themselves at great risk uh, to, to get their names up, right, to, to get up. And here we have an image, let me just try to get better quality uh, resolution on this image. But let's talk about you coming up as a kid in, in, uh, in Sheep's Head Bay, living like down the block from Sheep's Head Bay layup. Yeah, I, I literally grew up right across the street, like the other side, one, if you went down my street, one side was, two apartment buildings, one, which one I lived in, and the other side was literally Sheep's Head Layup. I didn't know it as a kid. We just would see the trains parked up there. But yeah, as I eventually found out, yeah, that was one of the biggest layups in the city. And so here we're looking at a picture on a platform with two of your friends, and you are the young boy in the blue opening up a marker, a pilot. Um, and it's it, it, if if one looks carefully, you see you with your shell toes and fat laces. Fat laces, uh, Lee, pinstripe lees. Pinstripe lees. There you go. That was, the, on it. that was the look, right? In the trucker hat, custom yeah. trucker hat. You mentioned and, to me that you were uh, a b boy before you were a writer. Yes. Uh, let's let's talk about that because uh, that was really that's really interesting because you, I didn't make you out to be a b-boy in all the years yeah. that i've known you so um growing up in sheep's head bay I, I moved to sheep's head bay around 1980 i was 10 years old and my block was just there was a whole bunch of kids my age group and super diverse all ethnicities nationalities and um a couple of kids that were a little bit older uh got into breakdancing. So of course we followed suit and um, then I wound up luckily getting good enough, enough practice. I uh, 
was accepted into a, a, in South Brooklyn, one of the hottest crews is called Twice as Nice Rockers, uh, which was a division of a Coney Island crew called Fresh Kids. So uh, I was actually the only white guy in Twice as Nice. So it was kind of like, uh, um, it, it, was, it was a big deal. And uh, every Friday, Saturday night, we'd be at Roller Palace, which was a skating rink in Sheepside Bay. And uh, they'd have breakdance contests and we had battles. And yeah, I was just a part of that whole scene. So, so what I find really interesting, right? Because this is about five or six years after Saturday Night Fever um, premieres, right? And that's the disco era. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and so you're in the you're you're right in that transitional phase where hip hop is pushing out disco. Yes. So and one so, of yeah our our um our DJ for the breakdance crew was Todd Terry, who eventually became a producer and is like world renowned now as far as music production and, and DJing, but yeah. he started off as a hip hop DJ for a bunch of Puerto Rican kids in Brighton Beach and, you know, throw me in the mix, a Jew from Brooklyn. <laughs> well, so. you, you know, what I like about that, that con there's a connection for me there. Well, when you mentioned your, your breakdancing crew uh, and their connection to uh, the Fresh Kids, uh, yeah. and which were also connected to the Wild Crew, yeah, uh, RT Wild, wow. RTW Wild wow Crew up in Brooklyn, Bo and Sago and those guys, and um, and they were up by Dewey Yard, which was not far from from where you lived. Um, right. So there's a there's a there is again. That's why it's interesting. I learned something from you in that regard because out of nowhere, I remember Min tagging up Fresh Kids on everything, and it kind of made he kind of just made that his crew. Yeah. yeah, for some reason, I, I don't know how I, I knew. I, I know they knew each other. I was a little separated from that because um, I one I was really young and I was just I wasn't into graphs. I knew it existed because I would see it growing up by Sheepshead Bay layup. I would see it all over my block. There were OE tags and trike tags and joust tags. Uh, Stun, Snow, Magic, Ram 707, who were Sheep's Head writers that just, uh, they did their thing because the layup was right there. We had Sheep's Head and Cherry Hill and Ocean Parkway with three huge layups that were, you know, within three train stops of each other. So, you know what was interesting for me in, the, in, 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 in that period, a thing about Brooklyn in that period there was more of a concentration of throw up riders and inside riders um than wild style riders am i correct yeah yeah like uh, on the irts you had you know the top the top to bottoms and panels and full cars and all that we had it on on our lines also but i think we were more we just wanted to bomb yeah like get up and wreck insides and outsides and you know I tried to do some pieces. I don't think I was very good at it, but um, so when you yeah, started, we, when you started, right, maybe like at twelve, thirteen years old, your mm -hmm. partners were uh, By Four and It, right? Then you you, you had see, you were mentioning yeah. to me uh, uh, Mad Subway Demons, MSD, your crew, um, right? And and then how eventually by eighty five, when you came to Art and Design, you connected with Rec. Um, right. And it's interesting because that connection, again, that's another connection we have is with art and design, um, yeah. high school, infamous high school of art and design. And that um, here, as we look at the paid piece on the bottom, uh, one of the things that is a signifier to me about art and design is the lettering style that SEC and you have that's reminiscence right. of Ants and Ernie and Size, those new wave the new wave crew. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the influence of what you were looking at in terms of the graffiti and how that was starting to like inform so, you. Yeah, there's IT and, and BY4. So um, yeah, before I really got into graph, there was a, um, 
like an in, a really large indoor flea market in Brooklyn called Caesars Bay Bazaar. And on this, I believe it was on the second floor, Ents used to airbrush t-shirts there. And it was kind of one of the spots that as kids, you'd go to the mall, we'd go to Caesars Bay. And I would watch Ents airbrushing. And I was just, you know, a little kid. I wasn't into graph yet. I don't even think I was really into breakdancing yet. Maybe I was. But just like to watch how he airbrushed and laid everything out his lettering styles. And then, you know, I eventually when I got into graph and I would see ends pieces roll by and tags, it was just, it was, it was dope. And it was a big influence on me. And, but in terms of your crew, the guys you were around at that age, um, right. what writers were, I guess, All right, so it in was, your sphere? In my immediate circle was, it was me, IT, BY4, REM, uh, YE, who was one of my big influences in DJing. Um, who else? RA, Tape, Sec, Dent. I don't know how I could, I could leave them out. Huge, uh, like, big part of the crew. And uh, that was about it from from our close area. We wound up, you know, hooking up with guys from other neighborhoods and, you know, local kids and a lot of guys from art and design. I would go to school and, you know, first two, three periods, I would hang out in the cafeteria and then cut out, like throw my book bag out the window because the, the cafeteria is on the first floor. I'm sure you know, but people yeah, that didn't we've go. done this plenty, yeah. And literally like, you know, wait, everybody, you know, count to 10 and boom pop the window open, throw your book bag out the window, jump out the window, and then you're on 57th Street and just, you know, running down the block. And we'd go hit a story, a layup, or just, you know, go out bombing. So when you, before you got to art and design, did you know it as a, as a school that would have a lot of graffiti writers? No clue. I, uh, I was already writing graffiti. Uh, so the, the year before... I signed up to take the test and all that for design. You have to, you know, do the portfolio and all of that stuff. So uh, I was already writing. I was already doing my thing. One of my friends is the one that actually said, hey, let's try out for art and design. So we both went, took the test together and all that. I made it. He didn't. I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to my neighborhood high school. Um, my grandfather at the time was alive and he was like, no, no, you made art and design. You're going to that school. So I went and I didn't know a soul, but I wound up, you know, when you're sitting in the cafeteria and you pull a black book out and you're just doodling in the book or working on a piece, the whole school was writers. So it's seemingly, so everybody kind of just, you know, gravitated toward that. And yeah. So let's talk about the black books, right? Because one of the things that was really interesting about art and design was how invested the writers were in their black books. Yeah. And I remember in the 70s, the the kind of guess late 70s, some of the writers that came out of that school, especially those guys who were CYA and MTA, they they were really heavy into the design markers and, and like super yeah. detailed works, uh, rapidographs. Yes. Um, yeah, and, I love rapidographs. Right. They were super heavily invested. And I remember... Uh, one, I remember Pays being super heavily invested in his his black books. He was a kind of a black book nerd writer. Um, but the one thing that we see in these in your drawings now is kind of like that that look and feel that was yeah. uh, well known not just in art and design but in, throughout the culture. Uh, but also notably the characters we 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 were discussing earlier the kind of the square eyed character yeah. um, that kind of uh, was born out of the, the, that school. Yeah. Yeah. Big influence. I remember there was, there was a writer who wrote, well, there were two guys, there was beer and shied S H Y D and beer was his dope letter writer, like super like dope styles and shied would do these dope characters. So they would always collaborate in books and anytime, like you guys had, you had beer and shy do a piece in your book, you knew you had something dope. And I actually had a black book 
you know, I had a I had a book that was all you know tags and throw ups, and you need a writer to get up in my book, yada yada yada. But then I had a book that was all pieces, and I had it was all dope art and design guys, and I wound up lending it out to somebody to do, uh, do a piece in it, and then just you know, never saw it. Disappear. Well, disappeared. one of the things we, you know, we have some black books at the museum. And one of the things I like to tell people about these books is how much they tell uh, about not just the artist, but the things going on around him and the people around him. And as we look at your, your drawing here with the kind of b-boy character sitting in between two trains and yeah. he's got his, his rather original sneakers, which right now, I guess you were ahead of the curve in sneaker design. But what's interesting to me here is that you have the M train and the R train, two different styles of trains. Right. Uh, um, and also riders, uh, presumably from those lines. Yeah. Yeah, well, those those were the two trains that, well, not actually two, because we also had Ridgies and Bulldogs that would, yeah. that would be on those lines. But everybody wanted to bomb flats because they were nice and smooth. And there was something about... Uh, well, we used to call them Star Wars, Star Wars or, or Vader's, some people call them. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, love those. Those primarily ran on the B line. But um, yeah, just wanted to mix it up a little bit. This piece right here is super influenced by Entz. I, I remember he had like this, uh, um, this piece where the letters were kind of like halfway down the middle, shifted in like another direction, like the opposite direction. So I tried doing my own little spin on that with uh, mm -hmm. with this one. And of course, adding, you know, some Baudet stuff in it. The books, you know, tell us something about the books and, and, and how you feel, uh, how you feel about them in retrospect and the importance of the black book. Oh, well, it, it was our way to practice and just develop our style. You know, it was, it's what we did, you know, it break was, out of books, sketch everything out. And then, you know, it was, I'm sorry. I lost a little light there. Um, yeah, it's just, it was, to you know, me, these, it, these it was visual much, diaries that say so much about um, a young artist. It say so much about regional penmanship uh, as well. Yeah, these books, actually, all of these pieces that you're posting, I actually don't even have these books. These are pieces that are pages that were sent to me, photos, over the past few years. Like, yo, I got this old paid piece of the book. Check it out. Mm. And it's amazing that, you know, the Internet, you know, because I, like, I remember doing that when I did it, but I haven't seen this since I did it. Wow. And here you are in the layup. No, that's actually... That's no, that's IT on the left, SEC in the middle, and REM on the right. I was there, but I'm not in the photo. I might, I, I don't, actually, I think BY might have taken that one. So what, in your time in art and design, what was your intention? What was your major that you were looking uh, at? I, I took commercial art. I didn't have any real direction. I just knew, all right, I made the school. I got to go there. Um, Nothing at the time was more important to me than graffiti. All I wanted to do was bomb. As soon as I made enough friends in the school to, you know, to cut out, and, and that's, that's what I did. So I, I wasn't there long. I was there, I think it was just under two full semesters, and I was cutting out so much that they were just like, yeah, you, you either we're throwing you out or you got to sign out and go to your neighborhood high school, which is what I, what I wound up doing. Right. And... And we discussed earlier about this, your, your first commission, right? It's, it's always those first commissions that really kind of change. I know for me, change the trajectory of my interest and, and, yeah. and, and what happens after writing, right? Like what's, what's your job, you know, like where, where's your career yeah. going after the train? So this one, I, right, so this was for a, a, a really large wall in Sheepshead Bay for a restaurant called Joe's Clam Bar, which there was a few other stores adjacent to it that I think the owners, like, he owned all of them. So I was actually a busboy at Joe's Clam Bar. And I spoke to them and says, hey, you know, we got this big wall on the side. Let us do a giant mural on it. 
And yeah, and they gave us, it was, me and Sec did it, uh, gave us 500 bucks and paid for all the paint and we got to keep all the paint when we were done. So that right there was exciting for us because now, you know, we literally went from, you know, whatever paint we racked to now we have a, a paint budget. Right. So, so now, now you're professional, so to speak. Right. Yeah. For, for lack of a better word. I didn't I mean, want to so, be professional. So, uh, honestly, I just wanted to paint without getting in trouble. And then everything else was the bonus. Right. So let's kind of transition a little bit because there it's at, at, you know, as you're coming up, you start getting interested in music. How does music play into okay. your storyline? So the block that I grew up on, um, like I was mentioning earlier, Todd Terry was the DJ for our breakdance crew. And along with DJ Yuli, uh, both of them kind of got, was really Yuli that it got me into DJing because he was an amazing DJ before I ever started. Um, they were both like big influences on me. And I would go to Todd's house and hang out in his bedroom where he made all these, you know, classic um, like freestyle tracks. And I was just always around it. Yeah, these, this is an album cover I did for him for uh, Royal House. And it's just, it, it's being around it made you want to do it also. Because it was like, it's the, the, being a DJ is the cool thing. So, and, I, uh, and how did you get your first gig? Because you were, what, um, what, 17 years old, maybe? Yeah, I, I was 16 years old when I started. My first gig, I, well, I, I would do local, like, you know, Kids Sweet 16s and school parties and stuff like that. Uh, my first club gig, I kind of lied to about my experience to get it. I was talking to the promoter of a club, and, um, and I knew that I could do the job. But he wanted, obviously, a, a, a DJ that had experience in clubs. I was like, oh, yeah, I did this place in the city and that place. And he's like, oh, yeah? All right, boom, next week, uh, next Friday night, you're here. And sure enough, put me in, and that was it. Just gigs started and coming. And... I, I know. I, I mean, again, clubs, the one thing that people should know is that clubs are also a, a hangout for writers. And uh, yeah. you 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 spun at, at limelight infamously uh, that was a church turned into a disco that was so scandalous but so cool but yeah. we we had already uh, been infiltrating the clubs like I, I know ernie spent a lot of time at this club i exhibited at this club hung out at this club um and Ken, it, i believe kenny kenny sharf had a room there hr geiger had a room there yeah yeah it was a really exciting time uh with with the discotheques because they were allowing artists to do installations. I mean, you had area back in the day. I mean, of course, there's the, there's the downtown clubs, you know, that that yeah. were the ones that were ex experimenting, but this was more of a high end uh, experience, so to speak. Um, but it, it's interesting to me that in your story that, um, again, you know, this part of 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 your life is is little known in terms of you as a dj and oh, yeah, yeah. as a young kid having a responsibility to keep several hundred people who are highly intoxicated and excited like yeah. it's shaking, fun though i love shaking it. their ass yeah i still love it still love it there was yeah. uh especially during the pandemic what i would do is i would i still have a full equipment a full dj setup and I would set up an instant DJ on Instagram live or Facebook live, but because of the algorithms, you know, playing music, I would get booted off constantly, but I would still go at it. I love, just love playing music. Um, here we have a picture. And unfortunately it's, it's, it's washed out. It's an old picture, but that's a young you yeah. in the DJ in group. Red Zone. Yeah. Uh, the red, red Zone, zone. infamously. What was that? Like 50, 55th, I think it was. 50, I think 50. Yeah, it's 54, 50, somewhere around there in the 50s. Yeah. yeah that and, was it. That and, was and, and no, it's system. interesting because, again, I was saying how, like, certain clubs had, you know, writers that hung out all the time, whereas, you know, uh, but that's yeah. that's a whole other thing. A, a but, I, you know, one. in terms of, of, of direction, one of the things that was 
really interesting to me that you just you turned to sign painting, right? Uh, why sign painting? What was the appeal, right, so, appeal so, of well, that? Well, it, it, it's not that there was an appeal. Although I actually, years before, I, I always took notice of signs. Uh, but what wound up happening was I, I was DJing, and I, I was the resident DJ of an after hours. So I didn't come home until 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. And didn't ma matter how much money I was making, I'd walk into the house and my mother's like, no, you can't do this. So, you know, it was constant fighting and, you know, all thrown out of the house and all that stuff. And my mother said, you need to have a real job, something real. And um, I happened to bump into a kid from the neighborhood and we just talk. He's like, oh, yeah, I just got a job at a, a sign shop. I'm like, oh, wow, that actually sounds like dope. Like, I, you know, I've always been interested in signs. Like, I, you know, I, I would sit in the car and, and check them out and see how, you know, paint, uh, when things would fade, you can kind of see, like, the brush strokes. So I said, you know, any chance this guy would be, you know, into, like, hiring. He was a helper if maybe he needed another helper. So we spoke to him, said, come in the next day. And I came in completely expecting to not interview, but I'm coming in for a job as a helper because I don't have any sign experience. He, um, we start talking and, you know, do you have any art background? Yeah, I went to art and design. So he rolls out on this, like a 16 foot drafting table, rolls out a big roll of white paper, hands me a pencil and says, draw something. So I'm like shitting in my pants. I don't know what the hell to draw. What does this guy want me to do? How elaborate does he want me to go with it? So I just drew from my graffiti background and I drew a mug holding a sign that said signs and um, comes back over and he looks at it and he goes, all right, be in tomorrow. And when I came in the next day, I didn't know if I'm sweeping the floors or not the garbage. He started teaching me and loved it immediately. Didn't know what I was doing and was horrible at it, but I loved it. And yeah, just kept practicing, practicing, practicing. And it, it takes a long time to get good, but yeah. yeah and here just, you are uh, painting the Custard King truck. Uh, yeah, I did so many of those. Yeah, you could, you could, hear, you could hear their, their, uh, their little music playing, the ice cream music playing yeah. when you look at this. Custom um, King, Mr. Softy. Yeah. Yeah, this one right here, I wish I had better photos of this. This, if on the hood, you could see. Nick at Night. I did, Nick at Night, they were doing a taxi marathon. And this sign shop that I worked for, um, they brought the taxi, and I had to letter the whole entire taxi, like a taxi cab, and then do Nick at Night logos on it, and, you know, the taxi lettering. And they drove it around the city to promote uh, a taxi marathon. Wonderful. Um, but, yeah. you know, you got so good that you decided to start a business, right? And you became yeah. enterprising uh, yes. with, with the in quick signs. Tell me, tell me a bit about this, this kind of shift in your, in your career trajectory. So um, I was working for one sign shop at the time. And another sign shop that I worked for previously called me up and said, hey, I'm super busy. Would you mind coming in after hours and helping me out? Sure, no problem. So, you know, coming in for one or two hours after my regular job turned into four hours, five hours, five days a week, and then a full day on Saturday. I'm killing myself. So I, I had a friend from the neighborhood that said, you know, why don't you, in, instead of working for two jobs, make signs out of your house. And I started doing that. And I wound up getting jobs that were large enough for it required that I at least rent a garage to do it out of because I was literally I had a small drafting table and I was doing it in my kitchen. And um, I met with a neighborhood realtor and says, Hey, you have any garages for rent? He goes, I got something better for you. And he had a, a small little space right off of the a main street. And the rent was dirt cheap. 
So I, uh, I took it. And uh, yeah, Quick Science was born. Well, what's, what's interesting to me, did you, did you in, of course, there's something commercial and, uh, about this, but also there's something about placement and your work in public. Was there any connection t to this kind of production that you felt was kind of akin uh, to getting up on trains and stuff? Was there kind of like- Oh, a absolutely. Of course. You're getting paid to have your stuff put up, whether it's graffiti or a sign or whatever else. Yeah, absolutely. I wound up, while I, I had the sign shop, I had it with um, my friend that suggested it. We went into business together where he handled the business end and I handled all of the, the artwork and production. Um, I wound up getting an opportunity to work with New York City Department of Transportation where I would make all the highway signs and street signs. And I'd be, you know, driving on the Bell Parkway on the BQE over here, over there, and giant, you know, 30 foot wide highway signs. Nobody knows I made it, but I'm like, I did that one. I did that one. I did that nice. one. You know, all the, like the, the welcome to different borough signs and, you know, Brooklyn, forget about it. And, you know, leaving Brooklyn and, you know, all that stuff. I made them. It's all by so, hand. And, and so how do they produce them? No, well, no, those, those, those are not hand painted. Nothing in DOT is hand painted. Everything is either silk screened for like the mass produced stop signs and, you know, no parking and no standing. Um, but all kind of like the one off or short run are all done with vinyl or reflective vinyl. Got it. Especially um, the highway signs need to be and, and and with a with a bit of irony, right? You you the graffiti culture pulls you back in to do signage uh, with the ones that you did for Scrapyard and yeah. So while I still had my sign shop, uh, I had a friend that knew Mark, who was the original owner of when it was Soho Zad and Soho Down and Under and all that. Right. So. We're, they're redoing the store, coming up with a new name. Ba, 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 ba. So they came up with the name Bomb the System. So what I did was I actually had a metal awning made, which is the complete background. And what I did was I took a Sharpie on a sheet of paper and I did a whole bunch of Bomb the System tags. Came up with you know, that one. It needed to be legible for the general public, but also have a, a graph tag feel. So Mark said, that's the one I like it. So mm -hmm. I scanned it into computer. I vectorized it. And what I did was I actually uh, full size. It's called a pen plot where uh, you actually run paper through a computerized plotter, which has a pen on it and draws out the lettering full size. So I spray glued that lettering onto this three quarter inch. So it's a plywood, it's called MDO. It's made for mm -hmm. outdoor use. Spray glued it on there, cut it out with a jigsaw, painted it all with one shot. And uh, there it yeah. is. And there it is. So when we talk about um, getting up, right? One of the things I, I, I've always loved about this relationship between the commercial space and the public space, but also the space in our heads about getting up and, and, and whether it's legal or illegal. Now, some writers, you know, they, they, I know early on and even today, you know, they have, they're not about these kind of commercial projects and uh, may have some, some issue about legal work altogether. But one of the things that, that I mean. found that I loved about seeing other writers do these you know more commercial works is how in the spirit of getting up how you know maybe on the trains you'll get several hundred thousand that'll see your your work but then when you do something like this the thanksgiving day parade millions upon millions will yeah. see your work uh, yeah this and you've yeah. done this project for what is it 10 years was it um just under, I think it was eight or nine years straight. So tell me about this, yeah. about having this huge responsibility. All right. Uh, so this was when I was at Department of Transportation. And um, 
we would be approached by, you know, major companies such as Macy's to do work, you know, they wanted their logo done in the street, but you know, how do we have this done? So because I'm a hand letterer and one of, there's another guy at the Department of Transportation who also can hand paint. Uh, yeah, we would go out in the street, we'd ha assemble a, a team of guys and, um, because we were a city agency, we didn't need permits to shut down Broadway. If they were to sub this out to a private contractor, you got to go through all the channels to get right. permits. And shutting down Broadway is not an easy thing to do. Oh, excuse me. DOT could do it. Radio in, you know, everybody would know, you know, the, the authorities. Um, sure. That needed to be there to, you know, the police department had to redirect traffic. Yada, did yada, you have yada. the resp did you have but, the responsibility of designing the graphics or what was No, it? no, no. They they handled all of that, but we needed to do was lay it down in the street. So we actually had it drawn out in like a one inch grid scale on paper and snapped chalk lines in the street. And the thing is that street, Herald Square. So the curb that's right behind me in the photo runs 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. But the opposite side, which is Herald Square, it's at an angle. So the street actually runs like this. Right. So it, it was, it's difficult to yeah, square Yeah, logistically, it. it sounds like a nightmare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Not fun, not easy. And remember, this is across the whole entire street. It's, it's freezing cold because it's, you know, it's November. You know, there were some years where it wasn't as cold, but a lot of a lot of times it was freezing. There's another so, project. And, you know, there's another project, a street project you did recently, which is tremendous and powerful and timely. Uh, and yeah. you were part of this, the Black Lives Matter uh, project. Uh, let's talk yes. about this because this was so epic um, in both uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. scale and diversity. Um, and uh, your your task was the S. S, yeah. So uh, this is like kind of like right in the height of the the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the house and my phone rings and I look and I see it's nicer. So I answer the phone. Hey, what's up? What's going on? And he's like, look, we got this huge project. We're putting together a team. Uh, pause uh, for a second. A Pause for a yes. second so we let people know Nicer is one of three members of the TATS crew. TATS crew, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, he asked me if I'd be down to do it. So I'm like, absolutely. So he says, all right, so each artist is going to paint their own letter, but the, the kind of the kicker is you can't design it. Nobody's designing their own lettering. They're having another set of artists design everything. You have to paint it. You, we don't know what you're going to get because we don't have it yet. We're doing this in like three days. Are you down? So I'm like, absolutely. Add me to the list. I'm in. So uh, it was the night before uh, they sent me this. It was, it's an S, but the artist that designed it, um, it's a, like photocopies of her Bible that she highlighted with a pink highlighter mm -hmm. so uh when i when i got there and i actually looked at it there were every this was not a fun letter to do there's a lot of writing in it mm -hmm. logistically it was just it was a nightmare aside from the fact it's in the middle of summer it's blazing hot and they're like i look i, I hate to do this to you but you're the guy that does lettering <laughs> we gotta give oh, it to man. you so yeah and, I hear you. No, you know, but it's what a like, great project. I, what what a great project yeah. to be a part of. In in my head, uh, like I'm saying, because actually, as I'm painting it and literally dripping sweat, sunburned because the sun's beating down on you. Mm -hmm. I'm like in my head, I'm cursing, saying, "I will never answer the phone whenever I see them call again." But at you know, at the end, when it's done, and well, you can step you know, back and say. Peter, some things, because you are blessed with a talent, you're called for, right? So you're on purpose. Yeah. And what a, what a great thing to be a part of. Um, and it's interesting to me because, right, there's, there, is, there is Peter, the, the sign painter, but also Peter, right. the graffiti artist, right? right. And I, it, it seems to me that 
that was always something in the back of your mind. And um, from our recent conversation, uh, you had you have provided the slides for the slide for all these little paid pieces you were doing on canvas, which right. were really kind of the jump off for something very important that would come up next for you. Tell me the importance of these little paintings and what happens after. All right. So I, um, I had no intention at all of pursuing my art career as a fine artist putting out canvas and, and all of that stuff. Uh, I was just kind of content with being in the sign world and doing what it is I do and all right, and that's, and that's it. Uh, still loving art in general and music. So one day, uh, a guy that I know, graph writer that has a website would sell small little canvases of you know, all different writers that he knows and, um, he says, why don't you make a few canvases? I'll put them up on the website. If we could sell them, you make a couple of bucks. If not, don't worry about it. So I go on Amazon. I order like a 10-pack of 8 by 10s some paint markers. I stop at the scrap line. I grab some paint markers. And um, I make a couple of canvases. Usually, it would just uh, – the, the two on top that are the pieces, those I didn't do yet. I was really just doing throw-ups with some tags on it. And I'd sell them. Started doing a few more. I'd sell them. Started busting out a couple of pieces. I was really rusty when it came to doing pieces. Uh, but I figured I'm bored of doing throw-ups. So I'm sitting by my, my drafting table one night. And how many more throw-ups can I do? I'm, I'm kind of doing the same pieces over and over. So I take some acrylic paint and I paint the whole background of the canvas yellow. And I let it dry, and somebody just said to me, why don't you try to lay out one of these little canvases as if they were a paper sign from back in the day, one of these like old bodega signs. So I do up on top like a little paid, uh, a little MSD crew, and I do paid one, and then instead of a price, I wrote 1984, like $19.84. And I'm like, wow, this is like actually an idea so i made a couple of little canvases like that put a few out and they sell and then i'm going to do another batch so i'm like let me break out some fluorescent spray paint backgrounds how i used to do them back in the day and i do um it was i, I couldn't because the canvas is so small i couldn't spell a tribe called quest i did a t c q and i wrote lyrics to go and then the year that the song came mm -hmm. out and I did a, a little series of all these little old school hip hop songs that I grew up on and put them on this website and they started selling. And I literally, I could not make these fast enough. Now, when they were really small, like these little eight by tens, I was doing them all with paint marker. Eventually I started going a little bit larger, 16 by 20s and 18 by 24s. So I was like, I got to break out brushes and paint. And I started actually hand painting and yeah, they just. Right. And there's, there's off. an appeal. There's an appeal to. Yeah. That's, our, that's, our, that's, there you go. Right there's there. the tribe. That's there's the tribe. an appeal to our senses, right? Of neighborhood and a time and place, which is one of the appeals of them. And they are, in a, in a, in, in, in a, such a strange way, uh, such contemporary pop pieces that I, at the same time are, uh, they're, they're full of, a lot, I think a, a great deal of sophistication in terms of like the messaging and the, and the, and the time stamping, right? That was a clever right. idea to do the time stamping on them. Um, and that you also uh, brought music uh, into it. You time stamped, you know, important yeah. music. So the, the photos that you have, well, the photo you have up right now, the Move Your Body and Beyond the Clouds, if you see right above it, that's actually the record from my vinyl collection of Move Your Body, which had a red label with white writing. And Beyond the Clouds was on the same label. So I kept things for that show. That was... Um, the show I did at 212 Arts, mm -hmm. where the whole entire show was just based off of 
my days as a DJ. And I painted a, a, lot, a large percentage of the paintings for the show uh, were inspired by the actual record covers. And I put the record covers up on the wall above the, the paintings. Wow, what a nice so presentation. Every, yeah. I, I, again, that you stood uh, very close to your roots with music. I, I really love that. And, and, yeah. and again, how, how instrumental uh, music is to your creative process. And then again, it just, it, it has allowed you to, like specifically with Run DMC, uh, yeah. you know, to pay homage to them. And, and you know, of course you see uh, DMC here with you. Um, yeah. And uh, of course it brings you back yeah. to your so that, DOT so, days. Yes, when I was at DOT, uh, I, I wouldn't do tons of street name signs, but once in a while uh, they would come across my desk and they knew, um, you know, I'm the young hip hop guy. So my supervisor walks into my uh, into my work room and says, "I got a good one for you." And he pops it down on the table. And I see it's Run DMC JMJ Way. So I made the actual signs that are up in the street, and then I did. I think it was like six, which were given out to like close friends and family. And I don't know if they're part of the photos that I sent you. But when I finished them, I took like a white grease pencil and I did a paid one tag on the sign, took a picture of it, and then I cleaned it off nice. just to show like I got up on it. And, nice, yeah. nice, nice. Um, and, and of course, that I guess that project with 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 uh, Red yeah. DMC led to this. No, well, no, this one actually. So Say Adams uh, calls me up one day. And I, I, I started going by his studio quite a bit and just, you know, bouncing ideas off of him and, and vice versa. So he hits me up one day and he says, hey, I got a project um, for Run DMC and JBL. Um, I think, you know, could you give me a hand with it? So I, I, made, I did the giant pattern for the Run DMC and the JBL. And then he goes come by, bring you paint and drop some paint on this thing. So I painted that King of Rock. And then right where he's standing, uh, I painted a yo. So, and then this was an, an, a wall, I believe it was 10 by 20 that was erected in his studio. We painted the whole, well, he painted the bulk of it. I just added my little, uh, some little lettering on it. Yeah, and then they disassembled it, shipped it to Las Vegas for a huge, event that was on stage with them. So now now that you find yourself having uh, both a little critical success and some uh, commercial success with this art direction, uh, and you you were included in, in the Beyond the Street show and actually you were there yeah. in person uh, doing these signs. Um, yeah. How, how has your but at, by by this point, you're well into it, and you're like, okay, I've got a winning winning formula. Um, where where do you go with this? So, all right, let me just back up a little bit. So, Beyond the Streets was a pinch myself moment. Um, I knew it was coming to New York because about six months or, or a little bit more than that, I was on the phone with Chino, just bullshitting about you know regular stuff and he had mentioned you know, beyond the streets they ha had already had the los angeles show they were coming to new york they were looking for a spot and uh fast forward it was the night before the vip reception for beyond the streets and i'm just sitting around the house watching television phone rings it's chino pick it up and we start you know talking and he says so the reason for the call is tomorrow's the VIP opening. I'd like for you to be one of my guests. And flattered beyond belief. Thank you, Chino. If you're still in the room, I saw you were there before. Um, so I went and, and got to see everything with, you know, um, but before, the, I mean, there were crazy crowds there because it was, it was an opening night. 
but um, like I really got to soak in a lot of it and meet a lot of people, which was great. And um, they had the opening that weekend. And then Chino calls me up and says, hey, um, Roger Gassman reached out and or, or I, I forget exactly how it worked out, but he wants your email address. I'm going to CC and link you guys together. He wants to do something with you at Beyond the Streets. Don't know what it is. Let's figure it out. And I see you, Chino. So, um, yeah, so we came up with the idea to set up a little kind of booth, as it were, and just to hand letter paint for signs for people right there on the spot. And uh, it went over so well that they just kept having me back. Nice. And one of the pictures uh, that you had up was of me DJing. I actually DJed a few events. Oh, it's back there. Somewhere. For them. Yeah, yeah, it's back there. So, um, and as no, a matter of it... fact, the night, the night that DMC, was, he was doing a comic book uh, and, a, and a talk with Sasha Jenkins. So I'm like, and they, I got the phone call. Hey, uh, whoever they had you know, to DJ wasn't able to do it. Can you do it? I'm like, absolutely, I'm there. So I pulled out a canvas and I'm like, I'm painting a canvas for this guy because, you know, of so um, yeah. No, you, so, you, were, you were very generous um, with the community and, and in sharing these works, which was smart because um, it really, uh, one, we were all very excited about it. I was super excited about it because, of, again, what, what it triggered for yeah. me. You're actually the first. I so when I when I first started getting and just to cut you off when I first started getting a little buzz, um, Chino and Keo both posted. I made two little canvases, one for each of them, and um, I think Chino posted one on a Friday night and Keo posted one on a Saturday night, and explosion. All of a sudden, it's like, yo, that's dope, ba 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 ba. So I'm seeing all these people, you being one of them, uh, and I reached out. I'm like, yo, I want to make you a canvas, and you're like, oh, absolutely, and I, I want something big. And blah, blah, blah. So, but it was you and Hayes that were the two people that immediately were like, yes, I want something, and um. I made that one for you, and I, I think you were living up upstate Kingston. somewhere. In Kingston, right. So to get it to you was a little, we had to work out the logistics and, and all that. But Hayes, being in Brooklyn, when I made it, he goes, come by the studio, drop it off. And just, he has been, to say a mentor doesn't even do it justice. It doesn't even. He, he's been so unbelievably helpful to me and we've actually built like a friendship and it's you know yeah, yeah it's it's great he's such a good guy and uh, you too uh, no no thank you i agree he's also one of my close friends so i know exactly what you're talking about yeah um and and again you know it's so wonderful that um you have found your lane um amongst your tribe and uh that you know, this work, you know, has its appeal um, in, in many ways. Like I said before, it's, it's yes, there's a graphic design appeal, uh, there's a language appeal, um, there is that uh, community feel appeal that you, it, again, there's that memory recall, the butcher, the supermarket, the bodega, the pizza right. shop, and so on. Um, and so as we, we start closing this up, um, I'm curious as to uh, what's in terms of these these works. What's next at, at for you with them, um, and do you plan to go even bigger in scale in terms of yes. the canvas paintings? So I had a solo show that was scheduled for May, but because of COVID, we wound up doing it in October at Woolworks. And although I included some of the bodega style. I, what I've been doing is remaking old existing New York signage, weathering them and just like classic iconic New York signage, um, which really, I mean, everybody seemed to get a, an amazing reception for that. And then I got some, a couple of other things up my sleeve that, 
you know, are, are, are in the work. So I'm constantly, I have so many ideas and I write everything down, but it's like, I can't get to everything. And by the time I try to get to this, oh, but yo, I got to do this. And then there's yeah, so unfortunate. What, what's, intense, what, what's intense about this kind of work, right? It's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's really a highly disciplined, time-honored skill. And it's not like, yeah, you, you know, like with a spray can, you just pick it up and just do that. No, and it's, it's not that at all. Uh, right. You know, it seems to me when I see your videos uh, that it's a really meditated process. It's a slow process, a deliberate process because typography has to look and feel a certain way. Right. Uh, you can't automate that. You know, I mean, you can to some extent, but not. yeah, but you can't, you can't. I've been reached out to 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 develop fonts, but I don't think my stuff would work that way. An e next to another e is not going to look the same as the other one. Right. Like like I literally build each letter for the word that it's in. So. But you you also work digital, no? Yeah, I mean, these days you have to. You know, have you, I, um, I, have I, you had an opportunity to work with Baker's um, Baker's brushes? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. As soon as I got uh, an iPad Pro and Procreate, that was the first thing I downloaded yeah, because yeah. it just seemed like so much fun to play with. Did you? Uh, you should. If you haven't checked out, the t if you guys, anybody who's watching, haven't seen the conversation, the, the art talk we had with Baker, uh, I think it was about a week ago. Um, really fantastic guy. Uh, really a big that that. That, that, that set of tools, the digital tools are so invaluable. Um, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about that. But again, it's nothing can replace, it. you know, the brush in the same, same kind of... Uh, Does, it doesn't need to. It's its own thing. Exactly. Why not just have another tool for the toolbox? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, listen, Peter, as always, my friend, always good to see you and, and check same in here. on you. And, and again, do a little deeper dive with you, with everybody who's been on our artist talks. Um, and so on behalf of the museum, our staff and our supporters, those who are online with us tonight, man, thank you so much for sharing. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll be, we'll keep supporting you and we look forward, you know, once this, uh, these travels restrictions are lifted, hopefully we can find you here. Yeah. I mean, be nice to get back down to Miami. Yeah. All right, brother. Good night to you and everyone out there. You too. Thank you. Take care.